This is Speaking of Pets podcast, where we give you up-to-date, accurate, science-based information when making decisions about your pet's health. From experts in dermatology like my sister, surgery, internal medicine, CBD use in pets, the pet food industry, you name it. If it affects pets, we'll talk about it. Today's Speaking of Pets podcast is sponsored by Blue Buffalo, the maker of natural pet foods. Love them like family, feed them like family. Blue Buffalo offers wholesome, meat-first recipes with high-quality natural ingredients in flavors dogs and cats love. Discover formulas for all breed sizes, life stages, and lifestyles. And with Blue Buffalo's True Blue Promise, that assures that real meat is the first ingredient with no poultry byproducts, no corn, wheat, or soy, and no artificial flavors or preservatives. Hey, welcome everyone to Speaking of Pets. I'm Dr. Alice Novotny Jeroman, a board certified veterinary allergist and dermatologist, and I'm Janet Novotny King, her sister, and I am not a board certified allergist and dermatologist. I am a pet lover and owner, and I'm here to make help um, help all of you um, make sense of what the doctor's saying. But you know, we have a really amazing surprise guest today. And who might that be? Well. Um, This individual graduated in 1977 from the University of Toledo, Go Rockets, I think they're called Rocky the Rocket, with a pharmacy degree. Um, um, They spent 10 years as a hospital pharmacist at the Cleveland Clinic and at Akron Western Reserve Hospital. And they were an instructor at the Northeast Ohio College of Pharmacy. And, you know, this crazy person who I happen to be related to then decided to go into veterinary medicine and went on a bazillion more years and became a board certified doctor of veterinary medicine and allergy and dermatology. And it is none other than the uh, Dr. Alice Novotny Jeroman. So if you didn't know about drugs, and I got to tell you, we've had so many inquiries about pet medications and I know there's some over-the-counter stuff you can use, but some you have to get from your vet. Some are used on humans, some aren't. Some of us are Dr. Googlers, and we try and figure out what to do on our own. So I think our pet owners and lovers out there would like some good, solid information on what we should do and what we shouldn't do. So I have a bunch of questions that have been sent in to us. So I'm going to start with those questions, and you just tell us the right thing to do. So Okay. My dog's limping, my cat's limping. You know, I can just see maybe they overdid it. What do I do? Well, the first thing you shouldn't do is give them ibuprofen. Oh. Ibuprofen in a cat will put them into kidney failure. One 200 milligram tablet. Four 200 milligram tablets in a 30 pound dog will give them horrible stomach ulceration. So no... Motrin slash ibuprofen use in pets. We have to remember that pets are not small humans. I have a perfect example of that. We have lovely neighbors, a doctor and his wife, who's a nurse. The nurse called me and said, hey, our black lab is limping. And my husband, the doctor, gave him Motrin. Oh. And I said, oh, gosh, Kathy, don't do that. You can't give Motrin to dogs. And of course, she just hauled off on him. You know, Nick, why did you do that? Blah, blah, blah. But right, because Motrin in dogs not only can produce gastric ulceration, but also put them into kidney failure. We have a lot of FDA approved non steroidal drugs for dogs and cats. We have Rimadil, we have Galaprand, Mm -hmm. we have. Meloxicam for cats, but there are FDA approved non steroidals that can be used in cats and dogs. So don't buy any over the counter non steroidals um, for dogs or cats. Now, having said that, people want to reach for Tylenol. Right. Well, Tylenol's not an anti inflammatory. Um, one Tylenol in a cat will kill oh. it. Okay. Oh. Yeah. And plus, there are cats extra not- now. You know what I mean? There's a lot in that one pill, they're extra strong. Yes, 325 milligrams. Cats cannot detoxify Tylenol, acetaminophen. They don't have the enzymes to do that. Genetically, they just don't have Mm -hmm. them. Dogs can detoxify Tylenol. And in fact, we use sometimes Tylenol with codeine um, in as post-operative for pain in dogs, but it's not a real common thing to do. But for cats, absolutely no Tylenol, absolutely no ibuprofen. For dogs, no ibuprofen, um, and Tylenol is used, 
but at the discretion and the dosage from your veterinarian. Now, what about aspirin? Aspirin in cats can last anywhere from three to seven days. It Again, they don't have the enzymes to detoxify it, so it sticks around. We used to use aspirin in cats that had heart failure where they were throwing clots as an anti-clot, mm-hmm. but now we use a drug called clopidogrel. Mm-hmm. Um, in dogs, we have used enteric coated aspirin, right. meaning it's coated, it goes through the stomach into the intestine. But, you know, things like Rimadyl and Galaprant, um, our non steroidals are much better at relieving inflammation than aspirin. So line, but thank you. That's a very good question. Bottom line is if the cat or dog is limping, don't give them anything over the counter. Go to your vet. Yes, and keep them quiet. Cage rest is very important because we don't know why they're right. limping. Is, did their hip come out of the socket? Did they blow a cruciate? Um, we don't know why they're limping. And also, when you're taking them to the vet, lift them into the car. Uh, don't walk them out and let them jump into the yeah. car. You may be aggravating an um, an already present injury. So yeah, lift them in and out of the car. And if you can't get them out of the car, call the vet once you get there and someone will come out and help you. Also, yeah. But cage nest. Cage I have also kind of um, palpitated paws to see if there's anything in there. Cause sometimes that's why they're not, they're limping. Right. Yeah. And you know, we were taught in vet school, when you have an, a limping animal, you start at the very tip mm-hmm. and you work each little joint. Aww. Okay. Yeah. Up until you get to there to find out, which one is affected. Mm-hmm. And and especially with back problems, you've seen your vet go down the back on each vertebrae. And when you hit the one that hurts, if there's a disc problem, you'll know it. Now, what about if the dog or cat is vomiting? And I, I have cats that, you know, eat al fresco, dine al fresco, and they'll mm-hmm. ralph up whatever they found. But I know that's because they probably overdid it. But like, if they can't stop, I mean, what do you do? Well, you know, let's look at it this way. The two worst things that vomiting can be in a dog or cat is intestinal obstruction, right. corn cob, um, small rodent, tennis ball, mm-hmm. women's underwear, as Dr. Paget <laughs> told us in a previous he podcast. Said that's really not an issue anymore. Oh, tampons. Tampons were on that ah. list too, if you recall. Yeah. Um, but So uh, intestinal obstruction or tumor are mm-hmm. actually the two worst things that could be. So when you have a pet that's vomiting, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it can be very serious and yet it can be very benign. They could have ingested a toxin outside. They could have ingested a toxic plant. Mm-hmm. Um, they could have gotten into your Tide Pod. So you kind of have to look around first and see what in the heck could be going on. Um, if, if it's just a kind of a chronic vomiting, which isn't, a you know, they still need to be worked mm-hmm. up for that. Chronic vomiting... I remember having a dachshund that had a corn cob in its stomach for three months. Okay. So, yeah. So chronic vomiting, you can use things like Pepsid AC. That's probably the safest drug you can use for vomiting. But here's the thing. You don't know why the pet's vomiting. So instead of rushing off and just giving it Pepsid AC, which it probably can't keep down anyway, good idea to see the veterinarian. They probably will give them an injection of something called Serenia, Mm -hmm. which is, we call it a centrally acting. There's there's a zone in your brain called the chemoreceptor trigger zone where it's the vomiting center. And this Serenia drug shuts that down. So, you know, I don't, when you're vomiting, do you really want to take an oral medication? You know what I'm saying? Pepsid AC is probably safe to use, but we don't know the reason they're vomiting. So we've got to find that out first. Um, can you give, a, do dogs or cats, can you give them human antibiotics? Well, yeah, there are very few FDA approved veterinary drugs. The majority of drugs that we use for dog and cat are human drugs. Keflex, yeah. amoxicillin, Augmentin, Bactrim. It, it's, those are familiar antibiotic names. Um, so the majority doxycycline of what we use in dogs are human antibiotics. Now cats, there's, there's a, a category of, of antibiotic called the quinolones, Levaquin, Cipro. You have to be careful because there's, a, there's an antibiotic um, for veterinary medicine that's a quinolone called Batril. And if you go over a certain dose for a cat, it can cause blindness. Oh. So that's why we don't want to use things like Levaquin or Cipro, which are human 
quinolone antibiotics because we don't know the dose of that that'll cause blindness. Uh So there are alternatives for cats, things like Orbax or Xenoquin that we know don't cause blindness, but higher doses of Batril will. So to answer your question, um, dog antibiotics are pretty much human antibiotics, okay? Cat ones, we have to be a little careful. And doxycycline, we all know as a treatment for tick-borne Lyme disease, in cats and in elderly people, same thing. If you're giving them a doxycycline and they get just a little sip of water, it can stay in the esophagus and ulcerate through. So, you know, a lot of elderly people, they're laying down in bed, they take their antibiotic with a little sip of water. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. A full glass of water or a meal after that doxycycline to push it down into the stomach. Because if it stays in that esophagus, you're going to get ulceration. Okay, so I'm allergic to doxy. How would I tell if I'm giving it to my pet if they're allergic? A couple things. Well, the main side effect of doxycycline in, in pets is vomiting, you know, because it mm-hmm. it's, causes GI upset. Um, but you want to give it with food. There's a lot of different side effects. Let's use, for example, sulfa drugs. Okay, back. I'm allergic to that too. Yeah. Okay. So are... Well, I would never use sulfa in a Doberman or a Rottweiler because genetically some of them don't have the gene to clear that. Hmm. And the side effect of sulfa in those breeds is it shuts down their red blood cells and they'll get achy in every joint. Mm-hmm. Um, some of them will get a rash from it. Rash as a side effect of antibiotics is more common in humans oh. than it is in dogs or cats. In dogs and cats, it's more joint problem. Um, just lethargy, not feeling well, that kind okay. of thing. Now, what? it's almost easier. I'm sorry, it's almost easier to diagnose um, an antibiotic adverse effect in a human than it is in a pet. That makes sense because they're covered in fur. Yeah, yeah absolutely, no, absolutely. So, can I give uh, my pets an over-the-counter antihistamine because they're kind of they're itchy or scratchy? You know, we did a little a Facebook post for the podcast mm-hmm. for speaking of pets about can I give my dog or cat Benadryl? Mm -hmm. And Benadryl for an acute allergic reaction is okay. But say, you know, I have two Goldens that have chronic allergies. It's really been proven long-term that Benadryl doesn't do much for chronic allergies. You have to give Benadryl before the allergic reaction to Uh, downgrade the histamine release. What it does do is make them sleep. Make them dopey, yeah. that's Um, Right. Unless you get a dog that has the opposite reaction, it gets them hyper because that has happened. Oh, no thanks. No, I, <laughs> oh, yeah. I can tell you with cats, any antihistamine, I don't care which one you're talking about, they're very bitter. You'll get the first dose in a cat, <laughs> but I guarantee you, you're not going to get the second one in because they'll hyper salivate. You oh. know, it's just like when you take something bitter, you can't wash it down mm. enough. Well, with a cat, try to catch a cat that's hypersalivating all over and retching. And I guarantee you, you bring that prescription vial with the Benadryl or antihistamine in it, that cat's out of the room. <laughs> so antihistamines actually in environmental allergies in cats can have some efficacy, but good luck trying to in get there. it. Hey, did you know that for dogs and cats that could benefit from a prescription diet, Blue Buffalo offers natural veterinary diets formulated by animal nutritionists and veterinarians for certain dietary needs like kidney support, weight management, gastrointestinal support, and my particular favorite, dermatology. They make a food allergic diet that's an alligator based called NP or a hydrolyzed salmon based for dogs and cats called HF. Contact your veterinarian about these prescription blue buffalo diets. Okay, so going out the other end, what about diarrhea in dogs and cats? What Can I use some okay. over the counter? Then I will tell you, if you've taken your dog to the vet and one of our producers knows about this, they will give you, the old thought was metronidazole, mm-hmm. which is generic flagell, mm-hmm. okay? Now we're getting away from that because we're really working on antibiotic resistance and not trying to reach for antibiotics as soon as possible. Now we're looking at using a probiotic, mm-hmm. which we'll come back to that, and, f- and a fiber substitute. 
And this has actually been used in dogs in shelters, dogs and cats that get stress, yeah. diarrhea, yeah. stress colitis. They've used a probiotic. They've used either uh, Fortiflora by, by Purina, ProViable or VisBiome. And uh, most of those can be gotten on, on Amazon. I know ProViable and Fortiflora can be. And they put them on a fiber supplement, like a psyllium yep. supplement, a psyllium husk, which is very cheap. They have found that that clears up the diarrhea much faster than metronidazole alone. Wow. Um, now, people will say, when I was a pharmacist and I was working some retail, I'd see them in the aisle by the emodium and they'd say, I'd say, oh, can I help you with something? Yes, my dog has diarrhea. I'm getting emodium for them. No can do. Because there are some dogs that have don't have the gene to clear emodium. Hmm. And we will put this on the um on the on the podcast. There is a uh, lab at Washington University at the vet school that you can it's I think sixty or sixty five dollars. They send you a DNA swab and you swab your dog's mouth and cats huh? too. And then they tell you the list of drugs that your dog can't take because they have this one genetic deficiency. And one of those drugs is Imodium. And what happens if you give Imodium to one of those dogs with that genetic deficiency? Coma. Oh, They're in a coma. Okay. And I, I'll tell you, 75% of collies in the United States are affected with this gene deficiency. Wow. Also, white German shepherds, uh, Australian shepherds, mm -hmm. and... and um, it's, it's the, mainly the herding breeds, but it's Washington University and it's called the MDR1 gene deficiency. And people have that too also. So these folks that have, you know, mutts, you know, you don't know if, you, even if you have a purebred, you don't know if it's your purebred. So good to yeah. know that. Yeah. They may have in the genetic makeup 60 per, or 80% herding mm -hmm. breed. And so then they could be positive for this gene deficiency. So we uh, um, Kaopectate or Pepto-Bismol, just because I know those names, you know. They're okay. Well, Kaopectate's pretty safe. Okay. You know, if, if anything, you're going to give too much and make them constipated. But Pepto-Bismol has salicylate mm -hmm. in it, which would it salicylate? Aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid. It's a salicylate. Oh. So if you're going to reach for something, Kaopectate is certainly safer than Pepto-Bismol. Okay. Okay, so now we have, you know, they're really going, that's the diarrhea. What about constipation? They can't go and they're straining. Well, whatever you do, don't buy a fleet enema because that can really screw up their electrolytes. I don't know of anyone that wants to give their pet an enema. Okay. Or themselves. It's, or anybody an enema. Okay. You know, I've told people, for example, you know, I have Capri, the 21-year-old cat in renal failure. We want to keep her going right. because... Remember that poop, and this is true for old people in nursing homes, we want them to poop because the longer that poop stays in there, the more toxic that individual becomes. Right. So remember I told you about the supplement called Porus One, P-O-R-U-S One, mm -hmm. which she's doing great on that. But I will tell you the other day I could tell when she was going, it was kind of hard. Uh -huh. So um, what, we're, what we're doing for that is I'll put just a little smidgen of butter on the side of her dish. You want to give her like a little oil, if you will. Now you don't want to shoot oil in her mouth because she might aspirate it and it goes into the lungs, but she licks that little bit of oil or even a little Vaseline. Huh. What is Vaseline? Hardened mineral oil. That's right. Okay. And you just, she licks it away and then that kind of lubes it and goes oh, through. Good. So we don't use things like Dulcolax. That doesn't work in dogs. You just have to supplement with like a table, like a like a German Shepherd. Let's take a 65-pound dog. You can do like a tablespoonful of olive oil on their food, but you never just shoot it in their they mouth. They would love that. Never. Was she, was yeah. she doing that when she was trying to go? No. You know what? She's actually doing, I'm not even going to say it because I'll jinx her. She's been, I've had her out in the grass walking around. Oh, my God. Well, I, I follow her well because hawks can come down and get her. I mean, she's 21. So um, I had to now remember I told you about the vomiting, the serenia. Yeah. Well, I, I actually got some serenia pills for her because in renal failure, you're sick to your stomach and she wasn't eating that great. And of course, I bought all this canned food at Costco. Now I'm going to have to donate <laughs> that. But that's OK. Um, she likes her. She, she doesn't want to eat the renal diet anymore. And I'm going to be real with you people that own kidney failure pets. 
they don't want to eat the kidney diet. I mean, mm -hmm. blue buffalo kidney diet is the most palatable. So I've got her some of that. And some days she'll eat that. So we're doing the old fancy feast. Yeah. Love and it. I'm giving her a little bit of serenia and I can see a real difference. Yeah, so they love she's got a whole little pharmacy. Yeah. They love that real stinky cat food. The wet. Oh yeah. They love it. Cause when we have the diabetic cat and they have to eat and you try and force a cat to eat, they have to eat before you oh. give them the shot. So we would just really put her on the washing machine, give her the stinky food she'd eat. And we'd put the insulin right in her. It was great. Nothing worse, nothing worse than, uh, trying to get a pet to eat. It's so sad because you're like, come on, eat. And you're cooking all this stuff and you're throwing stuff. I don't care about throwing the stuff out, but it's just yeah, breaks your it's heart. It's hard. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I get a bug bite and I'll use a little hydrocortisone on it. Um, what, mm -hmm. what can you use over the counter topically for your dog or cat? Yeah, I mean, there are some safe things to use. I don't have a problem with, you know, 1% topical hydrocortisone mm -hmm. is the strongest hydrocortisone you can buy without a prescription. Right. So I don't have a problem with that. You know, for example, if, if the dog, like um, Annie was licking her feet cause she's allergic. Okay. So I'll take a little 1% hydrocortisone and put it up in yeah. there and then keep her busy for a yeah. while. It's just, you know, some dogs or cats, if you're going to do that, remember what you put on the cat is in the cat because they're, they're licking, but that's true for dogs too. A lot of times it draws their attention. Oh, what'd she put in my feet? I'm going to try that out. So if you notice that once you're putting a topical on your pet and it makes them lick more, then don't do it anymore because it's just going to increase the problem. And they're ingesting it. Um, right. So what about like, like what is safe to like clean their ears or? Okay. Yeah. You know, I like my favorite homemade ear cleaner. And first of all, um, a colleague of mine in Michigan, he, I love, he says, it's Paul Bloom, Dr. Paul Bloom, he's a veterinary dermatologist. He said, I think the person that invented ear cleaning for pets is, is someone that wanted to torture their pet. Because seriously, no pet likes to have fluid squirted into their ear, massaged, and then wiped out. And I agree with him. I don't have a lot of pets do ear cleanings. I will do a proper ear cleaning for them in the office, okay? But to have them, to have you shoot, I don't like the sensation of fluid in my ears. So mm -hmm. my favorite homemade um, ear cleaner, and I don't shoot copious amounts in, I have them put a few drops in, is to mix one part white vinegar with four parts water. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you never okay. put it in cold because cold, water in the ear oh, no. can make you sick to your stomach. It's, it's a vertigo causing thing. So you always, if you huh. want to make it and put it in the fridge, you always take it out, bring it to room temperature, one part white vinegar, four parts water, mix it, put up. a couple drops in and then wipe it out. Yeah. And, and the reason I like it is because a lot of these dogs have yeast problems yeah. and yeast does not like an acidic environment. Wow. Neither does one of the horrible bacteria called Pseudomonas. But to be honest, when you have a dog with a Pseudomonas ear infection, A, I can smell it in the parking lot driving up. And B, it's usually so painful and such copious amounts of pus coming out that believe me, a little bit of vinegar and water is not going to do anything for that. You got to get in there and flush that pus out of there. Okay. So let's go down the pet aisle. It's like down okay. the the hair product aisle for humans. There are so many dog shampoos, kitty wipes. Right. I saw the other day right. it was like a like a packet of butt wipes, but it's to wipe your dog down. So I know. what do you use? I mean, I'm going to tell you what I use. I I have to use something strong because darling Libby rolls in goose poop. Everything and it's ugh. So I actually use um, Dawn because they use. Oh, right. You okay. know, and I rub it in and I rinse it really well, but it cuts that oil and it gets whatever's stuck in that fur out. Right. And it's probably not the best thing, but it works. Well, just for like a wipe, I love witch hazel. Oh. Witch hazel doesn't burn. Witch hazel is cheap. You just put some on a cotton ball. If you got a little wound on them, little witch okay. hazel. It's safe to use in the folded areas, you know. A lot of dogs have the screw tail, the tail yep. fold issue, like the French bulldogs. And you, it's nice to what, get in there with a gloved finger and wipe around in there hmm. with witch hazel. Um, the other thing, and people, this has been actually studied in people, but we also study it in pets, is bleach baths. And people are like, ah, I'm not putting my dog huh. in bleach. 
you mix one ounce of bleach in a gallon of water. Yeah. And I will, I will tell you the studies, and you can apply that topically to wounds also. The studies in humans shows that it renews the epidermal skin turnover and makes skin look younger. So there you go. Not that we want our dog skin to look younger, but it's true in humans. But yes, bleach baths, um, it's, we're now using a lot of that topically as opposed to oral antibiotics for skin infections in dogs. Um, the other thing that we use is chlorhexidine, anywhere from 2 to 4%. And you can buy those shampoos on Amazon. Now, I have a question. I know you had told me once. Oh, I yes, about tar shampoos. You never use a tar shampoo in a cat. Uh, in my 30 years of practice, I never used a tar shampoo. Sometimes Cocker Spaniels get this horrible, greasy um, seborrhea. And, and a lot of vets would use tar shampoos. It's way too strong and they can have a reaction to it. And the other thing besides tar shampoos are a no-no in cats is no head and shoulders in cats. Oh. That also is a toxic reaction too. You know, when people ask me about bathing their cats, my statement is, you bathed your cat and lived to tell about it. <laughs> because, because a lot of cats, it's nice to brush them, but they usually do a pretty good job on their own. Now, when they get to be older, they don't clean themselves as much. And so you have to get in there with those silent clippers and clip the mats out. But also regular brushing, a lot of cats love it. Some don't, but a lot of cats love it. But you, I think you told me once that, like, be really careful using hydrocortis around, around like your eye skin, your eye tissue, because it thins the skin. In, in people, because okay. it's eye, eyelid skin and scrotal skin are the two thinnest skins of the body. Well, I don't have a scrotal. So, in, in, right, in humans. Okay. Now, in, in, right. In dogs, um, and you can use a little 1% hydrocortisone. Like if there's, okay, let's go back to that screw tail. Yep. Those are usually so inflamed and some facial folds in English bulldogs, a little bit topical 1% hydrocortisone, just kind of smooshed in there, takes down the fire, takes the fire oh, out of there. Mm -hmm. um, so what about a couple of my friends, their dogs have thyroid issues. Yeah. So what can you tell me about, is the thyroid medicine the same as humans? Do they, is it the same dosage? Is it safe? Cause right. like you're on thyroid medication for the rest of that, that's life. You know, dogs are like on 10 times the dose of thyroid that humans are. Wow. We, we take doses. Okay. Say you're, say you're 120 pounds. Mm -hmm. You might be on 0 0.025 milligrams a right. day. Okay. A 120 pound dog would be on one milligram oh. twice a day. Wow. So the difference is dogs are what we call sloppy thyroid utilizers. They poop most of it out. When you give them a thyroid dose, most of it comes out in the poop. But that's okay because we check blood levels on them. So when you don't buy your thyroid <laughs> prescription medicine from your veterinarian and say you take it to Walmart and have it filled, the, the pharmacist is always, oh, this can't be right. This is way too oh. high. Well, if that's what the pharmacist thinks, he needs to call the veterinarian. He doesn't need to correct that on his own. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah. Because the thyroid dose in dogs is much, much higher than in people. I always like when you go to like the CVS or Walmart or Costco to pick up your pet drugs and they'll go, Shaggy King. <laughs> I know it. You know what? When I was a hospital pharmacist, the it, it's you fill prescriptions for people and you're making chemotherapy and all this and that. And then when someone we had a nurse that she had an epileptic dog and we'd have to fill her phenobarbital prescription. Oh, how's he doing? Is he doing better? What? How? Is he, how old is he now? Do you have pictures of him? It was so <laughs> like we love the break from human, you know, from humans. But you just know there's no human in there called Shaggy, right? <laughs> Right. But you know, I will tell you what's interesting. I didn't work at Ohio State. I didn't work in the vet pharmacy because I came home every weekend and worked in the hospital, human pharmacy. But you got to imagine when we're making stuff for horses, it's like the big cauldron. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're making copious amounts of stuff. And a lot of times we used a lot of sulfa drugs in, in horses mm -hmm. and it's sulfa is so bitter. And you know, you get the horse going in the tongue, you mix it in molasses. Oh, 
because that's, yeah, we always had molasses around. I remember when you were in the hospital pharmacy and you'd have IV bags of like white, look like milk. Yeah, that is um, IV lipids. And I will tell you, uh, when I, when I volunteer at Crow, the, um, the Clinic for Rehabilitation of Wildlife, when we get the red tide in and we get the pelicans that are walking around like they're drunk yeah. and um, other species, we put them in, on the IV lipid therapy yeah. because what it does for a lot of drugs, it forces it out of the system faster. It, it detoxifies them. I didn't them. know that. Interesting. I know it's called intralipid. It's fascinating. It saved a lot of, and we use it in dogs too for certain um, toxins to get it out of their so system. Do you have any tricks for getting pills into dogs or cats? Now we already talked to Dr. Linda about you know rehearsing and like doing it, and I think you know this whole thing. There's no way a cat's right. ever going to love that. There's just no way. I know. And, you know, dogs can be tough to give pills. You've got to give it in food. I don't care what they say. And what I like to do is do a chaser. So we'll <laughs> give treat, treat, treat with pill, chaser treat. Oh. Now, cats are too smart for that. What okay. Are too smart? So cats got to oh, use the yeah. pill shooter or you hope that you can have that that made into a flavored oral medicine hmm. or what we call a transdermal medicine where you put it on the inside of their ear skin hmm. and it gets absorbed into the body. But there aren't a lot of drugs that qualify to be transdermal because oh. some chemicals are, are way too big to be absorbed across the skin. I use like cheese, a cheese slice and mush it for the dog. For the dog. For the dog. Yeah. Anything, yeah. So, yeah. 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 And the problem with cats is it's a hard to give a pill. It, I, I'll agree with that. B, a lot of, of medicines are bitter. And like I said, with antihistamines, you'll get one in, but you'll never get that second one. in. The other thing, and who wants, who wants their pet to be running from them? I mean, you know, well, I do a biscuit, you know, a dog treat, and then I'll dip it in the peanut butter and shove the pill in the peanut butter. And she has no clue, but she hasn't been on any, she's, she'll eat anything. No issues. This right, right. I, 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 and I hope our listeners learned a lot about what they assume they can go to the drugstore and pick up or the pharmacy. And a lot of those drugs you can't, can't be used on our, on our. Mm -mm. And don't ever use something without asking your vet first. Don't just go by what you read on the internet, because some of that is misinformation. And that's the whole reason we're doing this podcast right. to make sure that you get accurate information so that you don't make any f regrettable mistakes for your pet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for listening today. And thank you, Dr. Alice Novotny, Jerome, and former pharmacist, Ooh, now I veterinarian. <laughs> yes. So listen, please like us, review us, and share us on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Speaking of pets, we love having your questions. Send your questions in. Uh, we'll have many more specials, specialists on in the coming weeks, and we hope you'll tune in. So this is Dr. Alice Novotny Jerome and, and Novotny King saying thanks for listening. Give your pets an extra treat from us and love them more. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for tuning in today. We hope you found the science-based information provided helpful in taking care of your pet. Check out our other Speaking of Pets episodes wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. So email your pet photos and or pet peeves to contact at speakingofpetspod.com. Remember to follow Speaking of Pets on all social media.